Hi guys, uh, here comes another video that I have actually loaded before, but uh, uh, apparently the audio in that video was not working. Uh, this is a good lesson for me that I should probably check the audio um, uh, before I load the video. So I'm going to reload those videos um, which have audio problems in it. And you might say that Sam, why don't you check the videos before uploading? Uh, that's a good question. I'm so busy that I don't get time to check, but thank you. Uh, I'll uh, What I'll do is uh, I'll explain this video again. So there are some important terms here that I want to explain. And this is very important, especially if you are studying the subject of maritime law. And uh, I, I normally cater to the audience of ship ma uh, masters and mates, uh, students and mariners, seafarers who are sailing on ships. But this will benefit anybody who want to understand uh, the terms, the basic law terms that are used in maritime law. Uh, so we'll be talking about MOU, uh, resolution, adoption, acceptance, approval, accession, amendment, and ratification. All right, so let's get started. So first, let me talk about the Memorandum of Understanding. So that is MOU. So MOU is Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, and as you probably know that it is a, an international instrument uh, which is less formal it kind of sets out operational arrangements under a framework international agreement. So MOU is normally entered into by states or by parties. All right. Uh, states can talk to each other and be, uh, form an MOU. For example, the European Union uh, has concluded an MOU with member states in order to organize the functions of the post trade control within the European territory. You also have the Paris MOU. So that Paris MOU led to uh, the post state formation of a formation of a post state control within a European territory. So what what does that mean is that means that some countries get together. All right. And what they say is that, uh, yes, uh, we don't need to inspect the ship in every European port. Um, one of us can go and inspect the ship and then pass on the findings to the rest of the members of the MOU. And that way, what they did is they are sharing the resources. The workload is shared. The information about ships is shared. And let's say a ship comes into a, one of the ports in um, in Europe and uh, they kind of uh, perform not so well in the post trade control and they are allowed to sail out of that port and then they go into another country in Europe. But the country that has inspected them previously will pass on that information and when the when this ship reaches the next port, it could be a separate country and you might think you have escaped the post state control. The post state control of the next country will be waiting there for you and ins to inspect your ship. So that is your memorandum of understanding. Now, these memorandum of understandings or MOUs are signed in different contexts. All right. It is signed between maritime colleges. It is signed. Uh, uh, yeah, that is an example I can give you. It is signed by universities uh, who form a memorandum of understanding and they allow uh, students to uh, learn different units and they recognize the learning that is uh, carried out. So there are, of course, different uh, context of memorandum of understanding, but because you are mariners, you must understand it from a context of the maritime function. Then we have a resolution uh, and a resolution. And remember, before I go into resolution, a memorandum of understanding is actually an agreement between two or more parties. All right. And it is outlined in a formal document. It is not legally binding. But the signals uh, that the willingness of the parties to move forward with a contract. So uh, they kind of uh, informally or right kind of uh, in a less formal way, they agree to work together uh, in, in kind of with the same objectives and same um, aims in mind. All right, let's go to resolution. Now, resolution is, as you know, is it is determined. Uh, it is a determination of policy by the vote. Now, uh, legislative bodies such as the International Maritime Organization, they pass resolutions, but they are often statements of policy, belief or appreciation. And it is not always enactment of statutes or ordinance. Once a resolution is enacted by a diplomatic conference at IMO, it becomes convention and is legally binding. All right. So you must have heard of uh, resolutions in in, in any time you in any time you uh, study conventions, you will hear about resolutions and uh, resolutions become very important part of any conventions or any kind of uh, legal terms. So many time resolutions are normally issued by the assembly of the IMO, the council or by the committees of the IMO, formed by the IMO. 
now each committee brings resolutions to amend part of the international convention that they are associated with all right for example like maritime safety committees will handle conventions related to safety uh, the most important uh, popular being international convention for safety of light at sea or solas or stcw convention so may the maritime safety committee will bring resolutions to amend any part of these conventions similarly you have the marine environmental protection committee resolution that amends the marpol convention or you have the facilitation committee resolution that amends the fal convention fal convention as you probably know is facilitation of maritime traffic so these are the examples of resolutions then you have the process of adoption so as you probably know adoption uh, it's a formal act by which the form and consent of a proposed treaty are established so you must have heard that a convention a certain convention was adopted or a certain convention was introduced and then it became formally ratified so as a general rule the adoption of the text of a treaty takes place through the expression of the consent of the states participating in the treaty making process all right and so uh, treaties that are negotiated within an international organization like the imo will usually be adopted by a resolution first of a representative organ of the organization like the msc or the mepc that i talked about whose memberships more or less corresponds to the potential participation in the treaty in question so initially what will happen is that uh, sorry about that so initially what will happen is that uh, the the committee like the maritime safety committee or the maritime environmental protection committee and uh, they will decide amongst themselves whether this should be introduced to the states or not and once they do that that is when they introduce it to the member states for the adoption of the convention or any resolution that they want to introduce then we have the instruments of acceptance and approval now the instruments of acceptance or approval of a treaty have the same legal effect as ratification so like i told you guys that when a convention is introduced or resolution is introduced initially it is said it is to, said to be adopted and then it is said to be ratified so this acceptance or approval is when the states they provide their acceptance so that the convention or the resolution can move from the stage of adoption to ratification all right so in practice acceptance and approval have been used instead of ratification when it is at a national level so constitutional law does not require the treaty to be ratified by the head of the state so acceptance and approval are the uh, terms used before the ratification at a more international level so when 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 the international states start to come in and they start to ratify the convention that is when it is at a more national international level but initially the any kind of amendment or um, resolution has to be accepted and approved before it can be taken up to that level then you have the process of accession accession is the act whereby a member state of the imo accepts the offer or the opportunity to become party to a treaty that has already been negotiated and signed by some of the other states this has the same legal effect as ratification now accession or the stage of accession usually occurs after the treaty has entered into force all right so once it has been ratified by a number of states then the the convention enters into force all right for example i can give you an example is uh, when the maritime labor convention was introduced it took a long time for it to be entered into force because the ratification requirement was 30 member states and a certain gross tonnage now they reached the requirement for the gross tonnage but 30 member states uh took a long time so the the that convention could not enter into force all right so for the trade and for the treaty to enter into force accession usually occurs after the treaty has entered into force so the conditions under which the accession may occur and the procedure involved depend on the provision of the treaty then we have the term amendment now the amendment term refers to the formal alteration of a treaty provisions affecting all the parties to the particular agreement now such alterations must be effected with the same formalities that attended the original formation of the treaty many multilateral treaties lay down specific requirements to be satisfied for amendments to be adopted in the absence of such provisions amendments require the consent of all the parties you as mariners must have heard of the term amendments amendments are frequently introduced to conventions and resolutions so that the whole convention or the whole resolution need not be changed 
an amendment comes in and changes a part of a resolution or a part of the convention and uh, with the years uh, amendments are introduced to reflect the uh, recent activities or the recent um, developments in the maritime industry so instead of because uh, changing the whole convention will take is a time consuming process it will be uh, it will take a lot of time so that is why amendments are introduced to the conventions or resolutions so what is the difference between an amendment and a protocol to amend now an amendment basically changes a part of something that already exists within a convention all right uh, so you have the nx6 uh, you already have something within a convention and it changes a part of something but a protocol to amend will normally add something new and thereby change the face of an existing convention so a protocol to amend an example is introducing marpol nx6 to the marpol convention that is will be a protocol to amend which changes the face of the convention whereas an amendment uh, changes something small it could be like a small change to the rest hours from making it 70 hours per week to 77 hours per week something like that all right then we have the process of ratification which you must have heard of this word a lot because in initially the you know any convention is introduced then it is signed then it takes time for the parties to ratify it and then only it enters into force so ratification defines the international act it is on an international level so remember that approval and all that is at a national level whereas ratification becomes more at an international level where a state uh, i am a member state indicates that it is ready to be bound to the treaty or a convention or a new amendment to the regulation it shows their consent by such an act they ratify it all right so when maritime labor convention was introduced australia ratified it way long before it even came into force so in the case of bilateral treaties ratification is usually accomplished by exchanging the requisite instruments while in the case of multilateral treaties which involve more than two countries the usual procedure is for the depository for example the imo secretary general to collect the ratification of all states and keeping all the parties informed of the situation the institution the institution of ratification grants the imo member states the necessary time frame to seek the required approval for the treaty on the domestic level and to enact the necessary legislation to give domestic effect to that treaty so i can give you an example here so let's say you know um the maritime labor convention was introduced now a member state an imo member state agrees to it but what happens is they ratify it but they are given that time frame where they can talk to the ship owners of their countries and talk about any kind of uh, issues or challenges or concerns or queries that the parties involved may have or the seafarers or the ship owners or the charterers or you know regulators have and then take forward those concerns and queries and then submit it to imo as well to address those concerns so that is the time given to the member states when they ratify it finally i'll explain what is signature subject to ratification acceptance or approval means so where the signature is of course subject to ratification acceptance or approval the signature does not establish the consent to be bound all right so you sign it you say that yes i am thinking about it that doesn't mean you are bound to that however it is a means of authentication and expresses the willingness of the state to continue the treaty breaking process all right so that state kind of expresses their interest to be part of a convention or a treaty or an amendment to a convention and then the signature qualifies the signatory state to proceed to ratification acceptance or approval it also creates an obligation to refrain in good faith from acts that would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty so an a state when it initially signs it they express an interest to become part of the convention and then of course they are expected to not um, do anything that is against the objectives of the convention all right but they are given some time before they can ratify it and implement it fully uh, within their state level because the convention brings about a lot of changes and those changes uh, sometimes uh, can be challenging to implement quickly Uh, they may face a lot of opposition from the parties involved so states or somebody from the state or when i say state i mean imo member states i mean countries they just can someone just can go and sign it and say yes i am ready to accept it because uh, he may or he or she they might face a lot of opposition in the country so what they do is they express an interest to be part of the convention and then they go back and they they discuss the terms of the convention with the stakeholders with the parties involved they note down their concerns queries feedback and then they bring it forward to the imo again and uh, this takes uh, this is a time consuming process but what it allows a state to do is slowly gradually start to 
understand the convention and what the changes it's going to bring about in the maritime community and slowly implement it gradually uh, incrementally so so that the change is not suddenly introduced and challenges everybody so i hope you guys uh, understood the meaning of these terms and um, and please let me know through your feedback um, whether you have any doubts or not maritime law is i love the subject but i try to keep it very simple and uh, straightforward for mariners to understand with examples that they may relate to thanks for watching guys and thanks for supporting the channel bye for now